Hello, I am Joseph Stalin, and I would like to share my story with you. I was born on December 18, 1878, in Guri, a town in eastern Georgia. My parents were Visarion Jukashvili, a cobbler who once had a prosperous business, and Ekaterina Galatse, a deeply religious woman who pinned her hopes on me, her only surviving child. My parents' relationship was tumultuous, and they disagreed on what I should become. My mother wanted me to become a priest, while my father insisted that I follow in his footsteps and become a cobbler. However, when I was 10, my mother left my father because he was an abusive alcoholic who would beat her and me. To escape him, we sought help from a family friend who helped us get by. My mother worked as a housekeeper for friends in the area, including a priest named Christopher Charkviani, who later helped me gain admission to the Gori Church School in 1888. Despite facing many challenges, including a smallpox epidemic that left my face scarred and an accident that mangled my left arm, I proved to be a capable student and excelled academically. However, I also gained a reputation for being unruly and getting into fights with my classmates. In 1894, I gained admission to the Spiritual Seminary School in Tbilisi, where I did well and even had some of my poetry published. However, my performance soon declined after I openly declared that I was an atheist and disrespected local monk. My contempt for the old order increased when I started reading forbidden publications such as Nikolai Chernyshevsky's novel, What is to be Done, and Karl Marx's Capital, both of which I became a great admirer of. I became involved in secret socialist workers' meetings in Georgia, where resentment and anger were growing against the oppression of the Russian Tsarist government. As a result, I became active in the local resistance and left the spiritual seminary school. By the end of the 19th century, the Romanov dynasty had ruled Russia for 300 years. Despite attempts to modernize the country, it lagged behind its western rivals, and a third of Russia's 126 million people were still living in serfdom, even though it had been abolished in 1861. The vast majority of the population also lived in poverty and had little or no chance of education or advancement, spending their lives tilling the soil or serving in the army. During this period, the government of the country was highly centralized, with ultimate power lying in the hands of the Tsars, who had near total control over virtually every aspect of Russian life. Along with a deeply conservative Orthodox Church, they had ruled the Russian people's hearts and minds for centuries. However, by the time of my birth, their grip on power was beginning to erode as resentment within the country reached a boiling point fueled by the spread of technologies such as printing presses. When the restrictions on the press were lifted in 1912, the literate citizens of Russia gained access to modern affairs and political expression became more prevalent. As I look back on Russia's history, I can see that the centralization of power was both a strength and a weakness for our country. It all depended on the qualities of the sovereign who held the reins of power. Alexander III was the Tsar when I was born, and he was a strong leader who stamped out any discontent mercilessly. But after his father, Alexander II, was assassinated, Alexander III became enraged and scrapped his father's liberal reforms. He initiated an authoritarian clampdown on the country, ending any hope of a more libertarian Russia. This decision would later unleash widespread resentment and hatred across the country. When Alexander III died in 1894, his timid and inexperienced son, Nicholas II, took over. Nicholas continued with his father's authoritarian policies, but did not have the wherewithal or willpower to carry them out effectively. His incompetence and weakness led to unrest and revolution, and eventually the Romanov dynasty was overthrown. I was living in Georgia at the time, which had been a part of the Russian Empire since the assassination of Alexander II, but had been treated as a mere colony. The Georgian people were oppressed and filled with resentment over restrictions on their language and culture. This provided the perfect conditions for the proliferation of radical anti-establishment ideas. It was during this time that I began my involvement in politics. I started working as a meteorologist in Tbilisi, 
which was an easy job that allowed me to read more revolutionary literature. I soon developed a fierce hatred and opposition to the Tsarist regime and the Orthodox Church. I began giving talks to local workers and organizing strikes in local factories which inevitably attracted the attention of the Tsar's secret police. To avoid arrest, I went into hiding and lived off the charity of my friends and socialist supporters. In 1899, I joined the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, which was a left-wing socialist movement that would eventually become the Communist Party. The party's tactics involved infiltration and agitation, where members would obtain jobs in local factories and stir up opposition against the workers, employers and local authorities. I excelled at this kind of agitation and became one of the more radical members of the party, promoting the use of violence as a tactic. It was a turbulent time in Russia's history and I played a small but significant role in shaping its future. I was just a young man when I started rising through the ranks of the Tbilisi branch of the RSDLP. I helped organize strikes in the local area and was nominated to join the committee of the local party in 1901. But I was afraid of being arrested, so I moved to Batumi on the coast of the Black Sea. Even there, I continued to organize protests, one of which resulted in many people being shot by the local police. I was involved in the instigation of an attack on a local prison where several party leaders were being detained during which over a dozen of the attackers were killed. After organizing yet another protest on the day of my comrade's funerals, I was arrested and sentenced to three years of exile in Siberia. At the time, being sent to Siberia was not always a death sentence, but it was still a punishment that people dreaded. However, I would later use this punishment as a tool of terror and order, exiling millions of dissidents, political enemies, and class traitors to labor camps in the frozen wastes of the Russian hinterland. Despite being exiled, I was determined to return to Tbilisi and help edit an underground newspaper called The Proletarian Struggle. I began to advocate for the Arjun branch of the RSDLP to split off from the Russian branches as I became disillusioned with the movement's methods and objective. This was also around the time of the RSDLP began to split into various sub-factions or groups including the Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin and the Mensheviks under Julius Martov. I sided with the Bolsheviks, who were seen as the hardline wing of the party, advocating strict membership rules and the nationalization or collectivization of farmland over the Mensheviks, who argued that worker productivity would be increased if a degree of private ownership was maintained. On 22nd January 1905, at a mass protest in Steve Petersburg, Tsarist troops opened fire on thousands of unarmed civilians, killing hundreds and injuring many more. This event caused large-scale unrest and civil disorder throughout the country, which would become known as the 1905 Revolution. In Georgia, there was rioting and ethnic violence between various groups. To counter this, I formed the Bolshevik Battle Squad with which we undertook robberies, raided arms, catches, stole printing equipment, and attacked government troops. Having established myself as a leader within the Bolsheviks in Georgia, I was sent to Petersburg in November of 1905, where a party conference was taking place. It was at this meeting that I would meet Vladimir Lenin for the first time. A year after the third Congress of the RSDLP, I made my way to Stockholm for the fourth Congress. During this time, a vote was taken to limit party fundraising to non-violent means, but both Lenin and I were against this decision. We resolved to continue our armed robberies, which led to me escalating my violent campaign. I planned a notorious robbery on an armed convoy in Tbilisi with Lenin, which resulted in the deaths of around 40 Bolsheviks. I managed to escape unscathed with the loot, and I also engaged in other illegal activities, such as kidnapping wealthy children and holding them for ransom. However, my violent spree eventually caught up with me and I was arrested and exiled once again. In 1912, Lenin invited me to join the Bolshevik Central Committee, which I accepted. I was arrested and exiled again later that year, but I managed to escape and went into hiding in St. Petersburg. There, I secretly edited the Bolshevik newspaper Pravda 
and adopted the pseudonym Stalin, meaning steel. This helped me gain the attention of other Bolsheviks within the Communist Party, and I became one of Lenin's closest allies. By the time the First World War began, I had become a highly influential figure within the movement. I was arrested and exiled multiple times over the next few years, and despite being conscripted into the Russian army during the war, I was deemed unfit for service due to my disabled left arm. I requested to be sent to Siberia to serve the rest of my exile, which was granted. During my exile, the February Revolution of 1917 occurred in St. Petersburg, leading to Nicholas II's abdication and the establishment of a provisional government. However, the new regime struggled to maintain control and the Bolsheviks continued to gain influence. Lenin eventually secured a majority within the party to attempt a coup. In the early hours of November 7, 1917, the Bolsheviks took over power stations and public services in St. Petersburg and the Soviet-controlled warship Aurora fired upon the Winter Palace. This forced the provisional government to surrender, putting Lenin and the Bolsheviks in power in Russia. They then began the process of consolidating their power. I was aware of the threat posed to our new regime and Lenin decided to use the newly formed Bolshevik secret police, the Cheka, to crush any opposition. Unfortunately, this resulted in the deaths of over 100,000 people, including supporters of the Tsar, the middle class and the intellectual elite, over the following month. Moscow was chosen as the new capital, primarily due to its centralized location and to distance ourselves from St. Petersburg, which had been the capital since the reign of Peter the Great. As the leader of the Bolsheviks, I knew that the weakened Russian economy could not continue the war with Germany and Austria, resulting in food shortages, discontent, and widespread chaos. Hence, I was eager to sue for peace, which would also help strengthen our control over the country. Fortunately, a ceasefire was agreed upon with Germany on December 15, and the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed on March 3, 1918, formally ending hostilities with the Central Powers. Despite our success in ending Russia's involvement in the First World War, there was still resistance against our regime. The October Revolution had effectively united people from all corners of the political spectrum against us, resulting in the Russian Civil War, which split the country into dozens of regions and states fighting each other for dominance or independence. With the assistance of Leon Trotsky, we managed to quell our opponents, despite foreign intervention on the side of the White Russians. By the 1920s, we regained control of the country. During the conflict, I was sent to Tsaritsyn, now known as Stalingrad, to procure food supplies and oversee the Red Army's campaign against the Whites in the region. I ordered the execution of anyone who disobeyed my orders, and my command of the Red Army was met with criticism from my Bolshevik comrades for my strategy, which resulted in significant losses. As a committed communist, I believed in eliminating opposition and advocating the policy of terror to accomplish this goal. During the latter stages of the Russian Civil War, I was assigned various military commands and was known for my ruthless treatment of deserters. My services to the communist cause earned me the Order of the Red Banner, but my increasingly brutal methods were criticized by some members of the Bolshevik Party. During my time as a key figure in the Soviet government, I played a role in the Polish-Soviet War. Despite often disobeying orders and facing criticism from within the party, the war eventually came to an end with a peace treaty in Poland's favor. This allowed us to focus our efforts on internal affairs, including addressing opposition to the Soviet regime that resurfaced in the early 1920s. The Civil War had caused significant upheaval, leading to food shortages and chaos across the country. This had caused urban populations to migrate south in search of food, which was problematic for us as our main supporters were industrial workers and city dwellers. To resolve the issue of food shortage, we implemented a policy on food requisitioning in 1921, which aimed to concentrate agricultural output and feed the Red Army and urban centers. However, this policy led to mass starvation and famine in southern Russia, resulting in the death of millions of peasants. This dire situation prompted Lenin 
to make concessions in his new economic policy, allowing state industry and private enterprise to coexist, replacing food requisitioning with taxationing that enabled farmers to keep and sell their crop. As a supporter of Lenin, I was an important figure within the regime and was nominated to become the party's new general secretary in 1922. This administrative position gave me significant power within the governance of Russia. As the party was the state and power was highly centralized, my responsibility was spread across the entirety of the Soviet government, enabling me to gather information on potential enemies. I gradually and quietly began to accumulate power through an ever-expanding bureaucracy which laid the groundwork for my eventual rise. In May 1922, Lenin suffered a severe stroke, leaving him partially paralyzed and bedridden. However, he was still able to make decisions and dictate policy, and I acted as his messenger between him and the Council of People's Commissars, keeping him fully informed of all political events and decisions. This also enabled me to control his communications. However, Lenin began to complain about me to his wife, saying that I was unintelligent. Later, perhaps fearing that his death was imminent, he dictated a document known as Lenin's Testament, which urged for a reform within the party's ruling elite, criticized his leaders, and recommended that I be removed from my position as General Secretary. This document, which Lenin wanted read out on the 12th Party Congress, could have potentially ended my career if it had been made public. However, both my fellow party leaders and I who were also criticized in Lenin's testament, chose to suppress the documents and not release them to subordinate party members. It was around late December of 1922 that the separate Soviet republics of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Transcaucasian Soviet, which included states such as Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, agreed to form the Soviet Socialist Republics, which would last until 1991 and become the second most powerful nation on earth with my help. Lenin, unfortunately, would never witness the success of his brainchild as he passed away on January 21, 1924. After his death, major figures within the Soviet regime began to compete for control of the Communist Party, and as General Secretary, I positioned myself as the leading candidate to succeed Lenin. My biggest rival in this power struggle was Leon Trotsky, a hero in the eyes of many Communist Party members for founding the Red Army and leading it to victory in the Russian Civil War. Initially, Trotsky seemed like the favorite to succeed Lenin, but I had been gradually using my position as General Secretary, which controlled party appointments to surround myself with loyal followers who owed their promotions to me. This gave me an advantage in wresting control of the party away from Trotsky and his allies and filling its leading positions with people answerable to me. Trotsky eventually began to criticize me, arguing that Lenin's new economic policy should be reversed and he allied himself with other leading Bolshevik members known as the Left Opposition and later the United Opposition who opposed my ever increasing grip on the Soviet Union. However, my position as General Secretary gave me control over the widespread bureaucracy across Russia, which fed me information on political developments and people, further strengthening my position. I then capitalized on Trotsky's growing weakness and isolation within the party and aligned myself with influential people within the regime, many of whom owed their careers to me. Within a matter of months, my rival was alienated and excluded from the country's governance. My policy of surrounding myself with effective yes, men proved to be extremely effective in securing power and maintaining it, but it eventually proved counterproductive. During World War II, government officials and Red Army generals were terrified of making independent decisions for fear of provoking my wrath. For the time being at least, I was secure at the center of my bureaucratic spider's web which enabled me to replace my enemies from important government positions. Trotsky himself was removed as the People's Commissioner of Military and Naval Affairs in January of 1925, expelled from the Central Committee in October of 1927, and later from the Soviet Union altogether in 1929. During his exile, Trotsky became the figurehead of the opposition to me 
and went on to write numerous books and articles condemning me. Eventually, I ordered my secret services to assassinate him, which succeeded after he was attacked with an ice axe by a Soviet agent at his house in Mexico City. After being taken to the hospital, Trotsky died from his injuries on August 21, 1940. Trotsky's exile meant that I was now the leader of a coalition within the Central Committee of the Soviet regime. As most of my fellow committee members were under my thumb, I was now the boss in all but name. The role of the head of government lay in the hands of my right-hand man, Vyacheslav Molotov, who was one of my most trusted supporters. Molotov would later play a crucial role in the re-establishment of the collectivization of agriculture and, in his later role as Minister of Foreign Affairs, become one of the most famous and recognized members of my inner circle as he met with world leaders, including Hitler in the lead, up to World War II. For some time during the 1920s, there were growing concerns that Lenin's new economic policy was too capitalist. There were fears that peasant farmers who had benefited from Lenin's reforms were profiteering by controlling the sale of their crop. This sense of distrust was then further compounded by grain supplies plummeting by 70% between 1926 and 1927. This prompted me to revise Lenin's economic policy as I could not afford Russia's urban centers to experience food shortages again. Another reason for the need for economic change was the relative backwardness of the Soviet industry, which lagged decades behind its Western rivals. Combined with the dwindling food production, I was prompted to enact the first of my five-year plans from 1928 to 1932. This plan reintroduced collectivization and gave priority to the growth of heavy industry. As a result, hundreds of factories, mines and plants were opened across the Soviet Union that doubled the country's industrial workforce from three to six million in five years and also increased industrial output by over 100%. This rapid and forced industrialization eventually gave the Soviet Union the industrial capability it needed to maintain the war against Nazi Germany. Without it, the country would almost certainly have not been able to manufacture the thousands of tanks, aircraft, and other war materials that were required in order to claim victory. Another part of my first five-year plan was the ramping up of my policy of collectivization. This inevitably meant that the Soviet Union's farmers, who had hitherto enjoyed a degree of freedom or private ownership, would have to be brought into line under state control. These affluent farmers, known as Kulaks, were a class of landowner who had, through reforms in the 19th century and Lenin's new economic policy, accumulated some degree of wealth as they had been allowed to sell their crops instead of handing them over to the government on the condition they pay taxes instead. This was effectively capitalism in many people's eyes within the Soviet regime. The assertion of capitalism, combined with a drop in food production and rumors of profiteering, prompted me and the Central Committee to order the seizure of the Kulak's grain supply, along with their farms, by force, after which it was declared that they were to be liquidated as a class, resulting in hundreds of thousands of arrests across the country. Estimates vary, but the number of Kulaks who were either arrested, sent to Siberia, or killed is thought to number in the hundreds of thousands and very likely the millions. This policy of arrest exile and eradication meant that the class of people who were primarily responsible for producing most of Russia's grain was wiped out in the space of a few years and would eventually lead to mass starvation and famine. The Kulaks were then replaced with collectives and communes, which involved peasants working on the now state-owned farms. Although those involved in this state-run system of agriculture did not own the land they worked on, or indeed the food they produced. Productivity slumped as there were no positive incentives for the communal farmers to work hard. Riots and uprisings then broke out across the Soviet Union in the late 1920s as a result of these policies that were then stamped out by the Red Army and the NKVD, which controlled internal affairs across the Soviet Union and would eventually be combined with the secret police in 1934 become my most dreaded tool of terror and suppression. In 1929, 
I enacted a further cultural clampdown on the population of the Soviet Union, in which schools were brought fully under state control, as were newspapers and libraries, and religion was also effectively outlawed, and churches were either burnt to the ground or demolished. In short, I sought to bring about total state control over every aspect of life from cradle to grave. Some have since suggested that I was merely concerned with gaining absolute power over the Soviet population, but it could also be argued that I saw state control as a necessity in order to suppress ideas such as individualism, which had to be prevented in order to lay the ground for a true communist society where religion, money and social classes were not a part of. In essence, I faced a choice between allowing a degree of private enterprise to continue, as well as freedom of thought and speech, which would have potentially resulted in the death of socialism and, by extension, communism itself, or enacting the principles of socialism, which inevitably meant that I would have to end all individual freedoms, as many people throughout the country simply did not want to live under a socialist state. Capitalist historians argue that this is perhaps the greatest weakness that lays in the heart of socialism, which seeks to end class structure within nations as well as private ownership in order to pave the way for a true communist utopia that is free of money and the state. As implementing socialism is entirely dependent on the population of a given nation wanting to give up their private property, collectivization has been attempted in the past with the state having to use force. In my case, my solution to the resistance of those who did not agree with my policies of collectivization was the use of force and suppression, which inevitably meant that state control of speech and thought was also necessary in order to crush dissent. Modern day socialists in the Western world have argued that the path to true socialism must lie in gaining the approval of a given population for collectivization via democratic means. However, as no socialist country has successfully enacted a class-free communal society, the validity of true socialism as a form of governance, not to mention its economic merits, remains hotly debated and deeply contentious, to say the least. In my case, I implemented policies of centralization of power resulting in the most ruthless and all-powerful dictatorship in human history, as control was totaled by the early 1930s and outside influence was zero. But these policies soon backfired in early 1932, when a particularly harsh winter in the Ukraine and southern Russia, along with collectivized farming, resulted in an unprecedented famine that would ultimately result in the deaths of nearly three million people. Despite the fact that the grain harvest in the Soviet Union was roughly the same as in 1930, my increasingly harsh requisitions of grain resulted in the majority of the country's food being sent to its population centers, culminating in massive food shortages in rural areas. Another cause of these shortages was my policy of selling the Soviet Union's grain supplies abroad, for which I received aid and materials for the country's industrial base that I was attempting to modernize and enlarge at breakneck speed. Many have argued that this famine was entirely avoidable and that my policies of redistribution have been its direct cause, although I myself blamed subversive elements within the Ukraine and southern Russia and attempted to deflect the blame from myself. After the murder of my close friend Sergei Kirov, the head of the Communist Party in Leningrad, formerly St. Petersburg, in December of 1934, I instigated what is now known as the Great Terror and the Great Purge. Some have claimed that it was in fact me who ordered the murder of Kirov as I suspected him of disloyalty and was resentful of his growing popularity within the Communist Party. Whatever the reason and whoever gave the order, I used my friend's death as a pretext to order the arrest and execution of anyone I thought was complicit in the incident, as well as anyone who had opposed me in the preceding year. During the Great Purge, which lasted from 1936 to 1938, I ordered the NKVD to undertake massive clampdowns on the Soviet population, the Red Army, and the Communist Party itself, in which potential dissidents were arrested, including many high-ranking government officials who were often exiled. 
or executed after public show trials. Estimates vary, but the total number of deaths that resulted from this purge is thought to have been as high as one and a quarter million people, including former aristocrats, business owners, and clergymen, many of whom posed no kind of threat to me. I even had the wives of many of my closest followers arrested and sometimes killed in order to terrify them into submission. Another weapon in my arsenal of terror was the gulags, a government-run system of forced labor camps that had been set up in the early 30s in mostly remote areas where people were sent as punishment and were in many cases worked to death. As many as 18 million people passed through the gulag system between 1930 and 1950, but the exact number of deaths is still unknown. However, some historians state that the total number to be around one and a half million people. As previously mentioned, the major part of my great purge was the liquidation of the officer corps of the Red Army, which was instigated to rid any opposition within the armed forces and further consolidate my control, in which hundreds of Red Army officers and generals were arrested and executed, as well as former White Army soldiers from amongst the civilian population. The historical consensus is that this purge severely weakened the fighting capability of the Red Army as many of its best and brightest were arrested, exiled or killed. When Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, my leadership of the army had been severely weakened by the purges, which hindered our ability to fight back. As a result, we suffered massive defeats and losses in the early stages of the war. I knew that Germany, a rising power in Europe, had a strong hatred for Bolshevism, so I began preparing for a possible war with them. Unfortunately, the purges of the Red Army severely diminished our fighting capacity, and while we had plenty of equipment, much of it was outdated or in disrepair. In an attempt to buy time, I pursued a policy of appeasement with Germany, which resulted in the signing of a non-aggression pact between our two countries in August of 1939, one month later, after Germany defeated the Poles, we occupied the eastern half of Poland, as per our agreement. During this occupation, thousands of Polish officers and members of their intelligentsia were captured and executed on my orders. This occupation prompted Britain and France to declare war on Germany, and I offered Germany support in the form of food and oil supplies. While Germany was preoccupied with the Western powers, I turned my attention to Finland, which I saw as an easy target to use as a buffer against a possible future war with Hitler and secure naval ports in the Baltic Sea. I offered Finland an ultimatum to hand over a border region and numerous Baltic islands, but they refused. This led to a full-scale invasion in November of 1939. Despite having the largest army in the world, we suffered a humiliating defeat against the Finnish army, which had constructed an elaborate defense network. We lost 250,000 men, while the Finns lost only 25,000. This defeat prompted a rapid overhaul of the Red Army's tactics, training and equipment in the coming months, which helped us prepare for the war ahead. I was responsible for the massive losses the Red Army had endured. However, I privately acknowledged that I had made mistakes in the lead-up to the war and sought to reform the leadership of the Red Army. I sacked my defense commissar, Clement Voroshilov, and replaced him with Semyon Timoshenko. I recognized that my disastrous invasion of Finland had many deficiencies within the Red Army identified during the conflict, which enabled us to prepare for the later German invasion. However, the ineffectiveness of the Red Army in the Winter War only further encouraged Adolf Hitler to hasten his invasion. During my early years as Soviet Premier, I regarded France, and in particular Britain, as greater threats than Germany, as they had supported the White Army during the Civil War. However, as fascism, and in particular, German National Socialism began to manifest itself during the 1920s and early 1930s, I was forced to take the threat of Hitler's Third Reich seriously, and thusly began to build up my nation's armed forces. The signing of the non-aggression pact with Germany gave me a full sense of security as I calculated that a war between Germany and the Western powers would last for years and give me plenty of time to build up my defenses. 
I hoped the strength of my armed forces would make Hitler think twice before starting any war. However, Germany defeated the French and Allied forces in just six weeks between May to June 1940, culminating in the French surrender which left Britain alone in the war. Hitler, after failing to invade the Iron Nation during the Battle of Britain, made the Soviet Union his next target. This invasion, which was scheduled to begin in the early summer of 1941, was codenamed Redbeard, or Barbarossa, after the Teutonic king that had fought the Slavs in the Middle Ages. It was comprised of three massive army thrusts involving three million German troops who would use Blitzkrieg or Lightning War to surround and annihilate my forces before driving onwards towards Leningrad in the north Kiev in the Ukraine, as well as Moscow itself. Contrary to popular myth, I received no concrete intelligence on Hitler's true intentions before the invasion began, as the reports I did receive were vague or unclear. Therefore, I continued to store for time, as I believed the German reassurances that the build-up of troops on the Soviet border were not part of an invasion, and hoped that they were to be used to threaten me and were part of an impending ultimatum. As for my plans, I turned my attention to the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, as well as northern Romania, which I wanted to use as buffer zones between me and Germany. And after they were incorporated into the Union of Soviet Republics in August 1940, mass arrests and deportations were instigated to subdue the local population. The reality was that I knew that Hitler was planning to invade the Soviet Union. He gave the go-ahead for the invasion by broadcasting the word Dusseldorf. On the afternoon of June 21, 1941, and at around 3.15 in the morning on June 22, Operation Barbarossa began with bombing raids on cities across the Western Soviet Union as far as Leningrad. After a massive artillery barrage had ceased, Hitler's forces crossed the Soviet border. Over the coming weeks, the Germans cut through my forces like a knife through butter, and it seemed that disaster and defeat were certain. However, despite the colossal losses the Red Army sustained during the opening stages of Barbarossa, which numbered in the millions, it ultimately managed to mount one of the greatest military comebacks in human history and defeated Hitler's Germany once and for all. Another myth which is often cited about me is that I failed to prepare the Soviet Union for the war with Hitler. However, when considering the fact that the Red Army in 1941 had the most men, tanks and aircraft of any army in the world, I can hardly be said to have neglected the country's defences. If anything, the Soviet Red Army was too large and unwieldy, as resupplying and equipping it with modern equipment inevitably took time. As we had never fought a modern, large-scale, industrialized war against a major European power before, the true effectiveness of our armed forces, as well as our equipment, was still unknown at that time. It should also be remembered that the German army in 1941 had just defeated the armies of France and Britain in a very short period of time. Therefore, it should be no surprise that we folded under the German onslaught during the early stages of Barbarossa as we were fighting the most highly organized fighting machine in the world at that time. Since World War II, many theories have been put forward regarding why and how the Soviet Union was triumphant over Nazi Germany. Some claim that Hitler was incompetent and simply declared war in the wrong countries at the wrong time, whilst others state that it was a close-run thing and could have gone either way. Many often claim that I myself was incompetent and only won the war because I allowed my generals to do their jobs. In truth, all the parties involved, including me, Hitler, and all the leading generals and military commanders on both sides, made massive mistakes during the war in Russia. Therefore, it is overly simplistic to attribute blame or praise to any one person or cite any given mistake as being a turning point in the conflict. Although the Soviet Union was far poorer than the Western powers, our greatest advantage in our war with Hitler was arguably the sheer size of our population, which in the early 1940s totaled around 200 million people, whilst Germany, on the other hand, had a population of 90 million, including Austria, Czechoslovakia and occupied Poland, 
More importantly, around 45% of the population in the Soviet Union was under the age of 20 in 1941, compared with only 33% of the German population, meaning that I could call on around 45 million men in total, if needed, whilst Hitler had a maximum of around 15 million men of fighting age. As of 1943, both the German and Russian armies that had started the conflict had suffered significant losses. However, Germany had a far smaller pool of potential troops to call upon during the war on the Eastern Front. On the other hand, the Russians were able to replace their lost comrades with men of fighting age. By the end of the war, Germany had to call upon reserves of men who were not of fighting age, such as children and even pensioners. It is worth noting that 800,000 women served in the Soviet armed forces during World War II, many of whom were deployed in combat roles, including fighter pilots, bomber crews, and even snipers. Tatiana Kostirina, a master sniper, had an impressive record of 120 kills before dying in hand-to-hand -hand combat in 1943. She was later posthumously awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Geography was another important factor that played in favor of the Russians. They could afford to lose massive expanses of ground to the Germans after the invasion began, which in turn stretched the German supply lines to the limit. This, combined with freezing Russian winters and the ill-preparedness of Germany's industry to supply large-scale war, soon led to disaster. However, we cannot ignore the massive impact the Western Allies had on Germany during the conflict. Across multiple theatres, such as the blockade of Germany by Britain's Royal Navy, its Arctic convoys to Russia, the Allied bombings of Germany throughout the war, the German Enigma codes being cracked, and the Axis defeat in North Africa, the Germans faced numerous challenges. It should also be noted that the first stages of the war in Russia, from a German perspective, were incredibly successful. The Wehrmacht maintained its fighting capabilities in the Soviet Union for a long time against overwhelming odds, which is a testament to the talent of its commanders and the fighting ability of its soldiers. The near total success that Hitler's armies enjoyed during the early stages of the war had as much to do with German military brilliance as they had with Soviet deficiency. In the initial stages of Hitler's invasion, his soldiers wiped out entire Soviet divisions who often surrendered by the hundreds of thousands. After the fall of the city of Minsk, a week after the start of the invasion, I was left in such a state of shock that I locked myself away for days, resulting in the paralysis of the country's government. Since World War II, much has been made of the fact that I, at the start of the war, acted incompetently by refusing to move troops up to my border with Germany before the fighting began. However, it could be argued that this was the correct strategy as the primary goal of Blitzkrieg was to surround and destroy the enemy forces in the field. Therefore, my decision to hold back large portions of my troops in the lead up to the invasion could be said to have been the correct decision as they would have almost certainly been eradicated in the first few days of Operation Barbarossa if they had been stationed closer to the German border. According to recent research conducted by German military historians, our Soviet counterattacks caused severe delays and losses to the Wehrmacht in the early stages of Operation Barbarossa and in the end delayed them for long enough to make the seizure of Moscow in 1941 impossible. I must also emphasize that our army and industry were geared towards fighting long-term, protracted wars. Therefore, the longer the conflict lasted, the more likely a positive outcome became. Hitler's armies were at their strongest at the very start of the invasion, and with every passing day, its numbers dwindled, its resources declined, and its supply lines lengthened. In short, although many of our counter-offensives early in the war resulted in colossal losses, we had more than enough reserves behind the front to replace them. In a brutal war of ideologies, which the Russian invasion became, the normal rules of warfare were increasingly ignored and each side fought with a ferocity that was hitherto unknown in the annals of warfare. Essentially, World War II in the East was about numbers, which I came to appreciate more than anyone, certainly more than Hitler.
I understood that the key to victory lay in manpower efficient and in plentiful logistics, and perhaps most of all in industrial capacity. An excellent example of our numerical advantage in equipment was in the production figures of our most celebrated tank, the T-34, which we were able to produce 35,000 of between 1941 and 45. These numbers were then added to by us, producing nearly 30,000 T-3485 tanks, which were the T-34s upgraded with an 85mm gun that was designed to take on the powerful German Panther and Tiger tanks. These figures compare starkly with the Germans, producing around 50,000 tanks from the pre-war period in the mid to late 30s until 1945, which included all variants of German tank design from the Panzer I, which was a light tank fitted with machine guns, to the massive Tiger II or King Tigers. In short, we produced more models of one world-class tank in four years than the entire German tank output from the mid-30s until 1945, excluding self-propelled guns. If we include self-propelled guns in these figures, it means that we produced some 1,000 tanks and self-propelled guns in four years while the Germans only produced around 630 tanks and self-propelled guns in 10 years. Also, when one takes into consideration that tens of thousands of American Sherman tanks, as well as all the other types of Allied tanks and self-propelled guns, the Germans were vastly outproduced and outnumbered on all fronts in terms of tanks and self-propelled guns by nearly 3 to 1. These figures also exclude aircraft, transport, vehicles, food, oil, and manpower, which were limited for the Axis powers, but almost unlimited for us and the Western Allies. Another staggering fact about the Soviet Union during World War II was the demolition, transport, and rebuilding of hundreds of factories in the wake of the German invasion. This involved entire industrial complexes being taken apart and moved by railcar, sometimes for thousands of miles to the east where they were then rebuilt safely out of the reach of Hitler's Luftwaffe. Our archives and records state that in each case, up to 100 railcars were required to move a single factory. As the leader of the Soviet Union during World War II, I faced an enormous challenge in overseeing the mass transportation of as many as 1,500 factories. This presented a colossal logistical nightmare and caused a huge amount of upheaval to our already strained rail network, which was already moving and supplying the Red Army. However, by 1942, our country was completely geared to fight a long-term, industrialized war, unlike Hitler's Germany, which did not place its economy on a total war footing until well after the war was lost. It can be said that the most crucial factor in our victory against Germany was my regime not collapsing, and it was almost entirely down to my willpower, determination, and absolute control that continuing the fight against Hitler's invasion was possible and winnable. Compared to the Russian defeat in the First World War, where the fall of the Tsar's regime itself led to the country's capitulation to the Germans, our steadfastness in the face of Napoleon Bonimart's invasion in 1812 was an example of Russian resilience. Therefore, the fact that our country did not collapse in 1941 and halted the German advance outside of Moscow made victory all the more likely, which was then made all but certain by the Americans entering the war at the end of that year. After the German reversal of Moscow in the winter of 1941, our story was one of continuing heavy losses on both sides until the strength of the German army was finally broken in the battles of Stalingrad and Kursk. We ground down German resistance until, in 1945, their country collapsed and with Berlin surrounded, Hitler committed suicide. Although I am rightly criticized for being responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of my own people, it must be remembered and respected that we, as a nation, defeated Hitler's Germany during World War II, losing nearly 26 million troops and civilians in the process. It is hard to see how anyone else other than myself could have held the Soviet Union together during the conflict as my near total control of the country was essential in securing victory. This is one of the greatest paradoxes of my leadership, 
as despite committing some of the greatest crimes ever perpetrated in the history of mankind, without my resolve and the massive sacrifices of the Russian people during World War II, the later Allied invasions of Italy and France would have almost certainly ended in failure as Hitler's armies would have been far too strong to overcome. In many ways, World War II transformed the Soviet Union into a world power. Although our armed forces dwarfed the American military in 1945 and occupied the entirety of Eastern Europe, the United States emerged from the conflict as the world's only superpower, as they were the first to produce nuclear weapons. I had known that the Americans were developing an atomic bomb for some time, and discussions had been ongoing in the Soviet Union since the 1930s regarding the possibility of building such a weapon. After the Americans delivered the final blow to Japan with the use of nuclear weapons in 1945, I greatly accelerated the Soviet program. As a result, the Russians tested their first atomic bomb in Kazakhstan in August 1949, making Soviet Russia the world's second superpower. With the United States as our adversary, we began an atomic arms race. I continued to build up our nuclear and conventional forces. Over time, each side created larger and more powerful nuclear bombs, leading to the development and testing of the hydrogen bomb. The Americans detonated the first hydrogen bomb named Ivy Mike on November 1, 1952. The Soviets soon followed suit by detonating their first hydrogen bomb on November 22, 1955, codenamed RDs-37. Unfortunately, I did not live to see the creation of this ultimate weapon. My health was failing me, and I took longer breaks away from government, sometimes for months at a time. I did not allow doctors to examine me for my increasingly serious ailments, and even had several of my physicians arrested out of fear they wanted to kill me. I suffered a minor stroke and a severe heart attack in 1945 alone, caused in part by the massive stress I had been under for the preceding 30 years. Additionally, I was a heavy smoker and regular drinker. On March 1, 1953, I was found in a semi-conscious state at my dacha. I had suffered a massive cerebral hemorrhage and died on March 5, 1953. My daughter later stated that my end was difficult and terrible. I went from being a peasant in the 19th century to being one of the most powerful men who ever lived in the late 1940s. In my early years, I was little more than a criminal stealing money and killing my enemy. But by the time I died, I had ordered the deaths of tens of millions of people through execution, forced labor, and warfare during what many regard as the greatest communist experiment of the 20th century. It is also said of me that I abandoned the ideals of Marxism by centralizing control under myself, creating a highly centralized dictatorship that only served to increase my own power. I denied the workers any say in the governance of the country, which remained in the hands of the few rather than the many. Many capitalists state that every time socialist states have tried to bring about true communism, the process has failed as many people naturally did not want to give up their families, property, and assets. This often resulted in the state having to use force, resulting in violence and death for millions. However, many people around the world today still hope for the realization of true communism, a society based on communal ownership. They feel that the transition from capitalism to socialism and then communism has never been enacted, as many socialist governments inevitably fall to power-hungry individuals like myself who denied the workers the right to govern their own destinies. As a leader, I'm often considered the most successful dictator in human history. Unlike Adolf Hitler, who ruled over Germany for only 13 years, I led Russia for nearly three decades and transformed the country into the continent's only superpower, rivaled only by the United States on the global stage. Some argue that the deaths of millions of our own people were justified in order to transform Russia from a largely peasant population into a modern industrialized state. However, other historians disagree, stating that industrialization could have been achieved through free markets and property rights, as in the West. Nonetheless, some argue that millions of deaths under communism were inevitable, 
as the only way to end capitalism and property rights in Soviet Russia was through force. I grew up hating the oppression of the Tsarist regime and believed that reducing the population to near slave status and crushing all opposition to the ending of private property was necessary to compete with the advanced Western nations. Thus, I created an authoritarian, oppressive and psychologically invasive state that was far more terrifying than anything those living under the Tsarist Empire could ever have imagined. Estimates of the number of deaths I am responsible for range from 20 to 30 million, though some believe the figure is far greater. Regardless, I am considered one of the three greatest mass murderers in human history, along with Adolf Hitler and Mao Zedong. In the West, it is widely accepted that the Soviet Union and its people played a crucial role in defeating Nazi Germany and winning World War II in Europe, as the country still had the largest army in the world when the conflict was over and dominated the geopolitical landscape for the next 50 years. Despite my brutal tactics, I am still considered a hero in Russia today, as I oversaw the defeat of Hitler's Germany and turned the Soviet Union into the superpower it remained until 1991. Overall, I was an intelligent, hard-working, ruthless pragmatist who destroyed every enemy who dared pose me during my lifetime and in doing so, built the most powerful and all encompassing dictatorship in history, in which I ordered the deaths of millions and got away with it. Whether I was a gold standard of dictators or a hero who brought about the downfall of Hitler's Germany and transformed my country into a superpower is up for debate.